Coming up in this Everything's Coming Up Roses edition of Inside Bellingham, the annual Mayor's Arts Awards honor the contributions of local artists, authors, and performers. We'll profile a popular local artist and award recipient. And see home high school students with the help of fire, police, and local businesses stage a mock car crash to drive home a point about safe student driving. And our firefighter in residence, Brian Flannelly, has a report on how Bellingham is helping paramedics across North America provide better emergency medical treatment. And we have some tips for doing your part to keep sidewalks safe. All this and a fascinating half hour filled with hometown information right here on Inside Bellingham. Welcome to Inside Bellingham. I'm Doug Waldo, and this is 11th Street in Fairhaven, home to shops, eateries, and, uh, well, just a whole lot of attractive nooks and crannies. The Fairhaven Commercial Center is also the Fairhaven National Register Historic District, which features 17 beautiful historic buildings. The Village Green between 11th and 10th Streets is a popular place for community events, from lawn bowling, to the Wednesday Farmer's Market. Fairhaven is just a casual stroll away from Boulevard Park along the immensely popular Taylor Dock and South Bay Trail. The Fairhaven area is rich in history and is a great place for people watching. You know, in Bellingham, we are blessed with a diverse collection of artistic talent from painters, to musicians, to dancers, actors, authors, poets, and a, a whole lot more. Now, once a year, the Mayor's Arts Awards honor all those wonderful people who help us see our surroundings in kind of a different light and bring us an immense amount of joy through their creativity and insight. Now, over the next few months, we're going to introduce you to some of the recipients of this honor, and we're going to begin with Ben Mann, who is a painter who works in both commercial and fine art. And if you have come to Fairhaven, you have no doubt seen some of his commercial art, his <laughs> whimsical signage on various establishments here. Now, we visited with Ben in his studio to find out more about the fine art side of this versatile painter. When I um, received the Mayor's Arts Award notification in the mail, first of all, I thought it was a parking ticket or something. <laughs> I had no idea. I was really quite, quite taken aback and quite thrilled. In the letter, they say that there will be a lovely ceremony. They also say that you'll have 60 seconds to, t to say what this means to you, which is charming. It works out to about 15 seconds per decade of my career. <laughs> As a kid, I created uh, line drawings that were decidedly cartoonish, and I was heavily under the influence of the likes of uh, Dr. Seuss, and um, ended up creating uh, a really rich sort of fantasy-based but pretty accessible series of characters and drawings, and I got to have cartoons published in papers. And Then when I went on to study illustration in San Francisco, they really encouraged me to go with that, because that's where my essence is as an artist. and so. Everything that I paint today, I would definitely say that there's an element of caricature. Consequently, I just ended up um, pursuing commercial art school, and I thought that I would become strictly an illustrator, greeting cards, uh, logos, menus, and so forth. And in 2000, when I relocated back to Bellingham, I walked into an Italian restaurant in Fairhaven, Mambo Italiano, and showed them my portfolio to uh, promote the idea of doing an illustration for their menu cover. And they said, that sounds great, but what about something for our walls? I just thrust myself into a play about someone who knew what he was doing. Lo and behold, there are a lot of people in Bellingham who bought it. 
I think my work is kind of all over the map, but generally it's a celebration on canvas. I have um, things that are sold both as retail items and also artworks that I've created that support other businesses, for example, signage in businesses, and then hand-painted items that are intended as retail items. It's actually very natural. Not only can I hardly wait to get to the studio every morning, but, um, but I'm very fortunate that uh, the artwork that I most love to make and the artwork that people seem to want to buy have become almost exactly the same thing. I think that that, that full circle, if you will, is an incredibly um, big honor for me, but it's also a real testament that Bellingham for those who choose to seize the opportunity that Bellingham and Whatcom County are really a wonderful incubator for both fueling a child and supporting a professional. It's, uh, it's tremendous. If you'd like to see more of Ben's work, you can visit two websites he publishes, www.benman.com and www.manalive.com. And don't forget the double N in man. And if you'd like to see all of the Mayor's Arts Awards recipients, you can visit the city website at www.cob.org. This is Grand Street, and a lot of progress has taken place here since last August when ground was broken for the new Art and Children's Museum. Construction is now well underway on this state-of-the-art building that will bring a number of new ideas in environmentally friendly building construction to downtown Bellingham. Now we asked David Warren, who's the president of the Bellingham Watcom Public Facilities District, and Mark Hanslick with Public Works to shed some light on how this new building will be going green. It's going to have a tremendous fine arts gallery the Children's Museum that is going to be fantastic, education, play, research. It's going to have meeting rooms, um, a library um, for research. It's going to have a courtyard that is beyond belief, that will be a gathering place in this community for years and years to come, and a cafe and a shop. So it is a full spectrum building that is just going to be wonderful and will expand and grow and uh, take the entire community along with it. Right now we're probably about halfway through uh, the project. We started in August of last year and so far it's on time and on budget and we expect it to remain that way. The goal of this project is to have it become a LEED Silver certified building. LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Some of the more interesting components that go into that certification are recycling existing materials, using green power, and conservation of water. One of the features in this building will be the rainwater collection and reuse system whereby the water from the roof is collected into cisterns and then plumbed through the toilets. Another interesting point is that the original building that stood here, after it was demolished, 85% of it by weight was recycled. And the, for the materials that are going into this, 25% of them need to be recycled material. The city also received a stormwater grant for this building, which the the purpose of the grant is to provide a visual education tool for people who visit the Art and Children's Museum and to demonstrate to contractors how to practically construct uh, these sorts of environmental elements which really aren't too common here in the city of Bellingham. Families with children are going to be coming to this museum to get education, art, play, family opportunities. The building will go on long after we're gone. I think it is just a tremendous addition to a fast-moving, fast-thriving city. You can sidewalk supervised construction for yourself at Flora and Grand Streets, or you can visit the city website at www.cob.org to find out more about this environmentally friendly new building. It's springtime and 
that's great. But unfortunately, spring is also a time when automobile-related student accidents increase nationwide. And regrettably, many of these accidents will be deadly. Each year, thousands could be prevented by driver sobriety and caution. Carla Labrie and Olivia Flory, both seniors at uh, Seaholm High School, recently undertook a major project involving city police and fire, Valley Funeral Service, and Johnson's Towing. All involved wanted to drive home the message that students need to be both sober and cautious while behind the wheel. Um, in 2005, I had two people that were um, really important in my life die in a drunk driving accident. They both had graduated the June before um, and they were just so young and they had so much to go for and it just it happened so fast and so sudden and it was just a really impacting thing that happened in my life and I wanted this it had been really resting on my heart pretty hard for the last few years and I just really wanted to do something that could alter a decision that someone makes and just prevent families and friends to have to go through this again. Today, today we're going to see a mock DUI crash. So what you guys are going to view today is basically the results after somebody chose to drink and drive. Okay. I think it's always been a very prominent issue and because of all the recent crashes it's kind of seeming like it's a bigger problem now in Bellingham. 911. Okay, where does this happen at? Uh, you see home high school? See home high school? Is anyone injured? Uh, my friend is covered in blood. I think they're unconscious. If they're not moving, he might be dead. Certainly the idea here is, is, is all of our decisions that we make have consequences. Um, if you choose to drink and drive, uh, this is the likely result. What you just heard was a 911 call and uh, the dispatch to both police and fire. Um, right now what you're experiencing is, is, is response time. That can be anywhere from 30 seconds to maybe four minutes. It just it depends. Um, these are the results of a head-on collision. Uh, David Bagenstoss was driving the, the Dodge pickup truck. His uh, passenger is Anna. She's lying on the, the ground there. She was not wearing her seatbelt and went through the windshield. Uh, you see in the, the red Beretta here, we've got Phoebe and Ben. And uh, they were headed down to, uh, down to, to the movies behind us, uh, right next to the keg. We try to make the mock DUI as realistic as possible. Um, we use students from, from class here that these kids all know and have relationships with as actors. Um, so it kind of personalizes it for them. Is she okay? No, she's not. Sit down and wait for further help. But one of the, the functions of the Bellingham Police Department is education. Uh, we have a, a number of different programs within our department uh, to help educate the public on a number of different things. Um, one of the, the benefits of, of our school resource officer program is we're able to participate in projects such as these. Uh, certainly there are a number of educational uh, points that we're trying to make here, but I think the most important one is, is we're trying to save yeah, lives here. On here. we got a critical, we've got one DOA there on the road. And could you... Uh... What I want you to do is just follow my pen at the tip, only with your eyes, don't move your head. Do you understand? Okay, right up here. All, only your eyes. Don't move your head. Okay, what you saw there was an investigation for vehicular homicide. Uh, it began immediately when Officer Howell began speaking with uh, Mr. Bagenstoss. She probably uh, smelled the odor of intoxicants coming from him. Uh, she probably noticed his slurred speech. You, since you're under arrest for vehicular homicide, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. Theum's done this once every five years, and I think it's an important thing that the future um, can continue to watch it and continue to do it, and just the awareness is out there for students and families that drunk driving does happen and it is preventable. David, do you understand your rights? Yes. You can find out more about city police and fire as well as efforts to curb drunk driving by visiting the city's website, www.cob.org. The Bellingham Fire Department contributes significantly 
to the international base of knowledge of medical emergency treatment by testing and analyzing new medical devices in our community. Now this means that our firefighters and paramedics are often using life-saving equipment that uh, is not yet available elsewhere. And we asked firefighter and paramedic Brian Flannelly to tell us more about this really exceptional program. The whole concept of paramedic level care is to bring the advanced life-saving capabilities of the emergency room directly to the patient, wherever they may be. This saves time, which saves lives. But the pre-hospital environment is radically different than that of the hospital. So a machine that works perfectly well in here turns out to be too large, heavy, and fragile to carry into your living room or use on the side of the road. For the last 35 years, the Bellingham Fire Department, Wacom Medic One, has been working with various high-tech manufacturers to adapt these machines for use out in the field. And today, we're going to have a look at a few of them. What's your name? Every call begins with an assessment of the basics, airway, breathing, and circulation. When a patient has stopped breathing or has a compromised airway, we may choose to insert an endotracheal tube past the vocal cord so we can breathe for them. A traditional endotracheal blade has a bright light near the tip. We use a combination of gentle neck movement and blade pressure to line up the paramedic's eye, the back of the throat, and the vocal cords before we can pass the tube. This process becomes more complicated when stomach contents are present, potential spinal fractures limit neck movement, the patient is in awkward position, or crush injuries block the throat. A new device called the GlideScope minimizes these factors by placing a small video camera near the tip of the blade. The attached screen puts the paramedic size right next to the vocal cords without moving the patient. The glide scope is proving to be small, light, and rugged. In addition, our ongoing study is showing a significant reduction in the amount of time it takes to intubate a patient, which improves survival rates. But what about those times when the patient's breathing is compromised, but intubation may not be the best option? If the patient is still conscious, they will have a gag reflex, which blocks the tube. This can be overcome by the use of paralytic medications, but those do carry some risk. The continuous positive airway pressure machine allows us to assist conscious patients who need help without having to insert a tube. With this device, after the patient exhales, a small amount of residual pressure keeps the small spaces in the lungs from collapsing. This also helps congestive heart failure patients because it forces excess fluids from the lungs back into the bloodstream. And if additional medication is needed, then it can be introduced by a nebulizer that plugs into the tubing. And how do we know that these devices are helping the patient? That's where the pulse oximetry capnograph machine comes in. This clip has a light that passes through the finger or earlobe. The screen shows both the heart rate and how much oxygen is in the bloodstream. The device also measures how much carbon dioxide is exhaled. This indicates how well the heart and lungs are functioning. And how do we perform the field evaluations of these very expensive medical devices? Well, first comes the durability test. Okay, we really don't do that. Instead, what we do is fill out forms. Lots and lots of forms. And we talk to the engineers. The feedback that we give allows them to modify their devices into something that will actually work well for us out in the field. And in some cases, it's eventually led to Food and Drug Administration approval for their projects. So this time we've talked about airway and breathing devices. Next time we'll talk about circulation and a two-year study that we're doing for the National Institute of Health. Find out more about what goes on at the Bellingham Fire Department. You can visit the department website at www.cob.org slash fire. And now for another Inside Bellingham quiz. What is the best way to advocate for transportation improvements in the city of Bellingham? Right, get involved with your neighborhood. Bellingham streets are shared by bicycles, cars, buses, and pedestrians. And when city officials consider how to improve the safety and efficiency of travel, they rely on you 
to help identify and prioritize the greatest needs. Now, one of our most important transportation planning processes is the Transportation Improvement Program, also known as TIP. Now, TIP is updated every year to identify transportation needs and priorities citywide. Now, transportation planner Chris Como explains more. Well, we're standing here on the Alabama Street overpass, the bicycle and pedestrian facility. That project was on the six-year tip several years ago. It's a very important piece of bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure connecting a citywide trail system. Just down the street here at the intersection of Woburn and Alabama last year, we, we added some turning lanes for southbound traffic to turn west onto Alabama Street. The TIP stands for Transportation Improvement Program, and it, what it does is it, it is an accounting and prioritization of all the important transportation infrastructure improvements that are planned for Bellingham, whether it's bicycle and pedestrian or street improvements. We're trying to show what the priority is in the city of Bellingham and then how we propose to pay for that. The six-year tip typically has things like bicycle lanes, pedestrian sidewalks, um, street improvements, maybe intersection improvements, or roundabouts. So we're really talking about the larger projects, the really expensive projects that we have to program money for and, and decide how long it's going to take us to find the money and then actually construct the facility. We put bigger projects on the six-year tip because normally we are showing the public how we're proposing to spend a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars and it's important for us to be able to show the state how we're spending our street fund money and then if we need grant money for a project it's really important to be able to demonstrate to the grant funding agency that this has been identified as one of the city's priorities therefore it's a good candidate for grant funding and um, typically the type of projects that end up on the six-year tip are pulled right from the transportation element of the city comprehensive plan which is again identifying the needs and the priorities of the city it's kind of uh, making sure that what we're funding for our improvements is consistent with the planning that we've done so we're trying to accommodate growth and attend to our infrastructure needs all in one bundle we're really trying to show people through this document how the money for transportation improvements is being spent and, and what kind of projects we're funding. We're more than ever uh, funding bicycle and pedestrian projects. Last year's six-year tip was over 50 percent bicycle and pedestrian projects. Uh, I fully expect that that will continue, um, but again we have to look citywide for where our needs are and, and what we can afford to build. What we try to do when we prioritize is look at citywide transportation benefit and cost, of course, and how much money we have to work with. We've really tried to change things to be more neighborhood inclusive, and we ask neighborhoods to submit their priorities to us. That doesn't mean that it's automatically going to get on the six-year tip because it's a competitive process. The whole tip only has about 25 projects on it, and we have 23 neighborhoods. Again, we're trying to involve people more and more uh, as each year goes by. Have an idea for transportation projects? The city's process for considering transportation improvements begins with our neighborhood associations, where ideas and concerns are prioritized among neighbors. Talk to your neighborhood association president for details, or contact the Public Works Department at 778 Seven nine hundred. Spring is a great time to make sure that your trees and uh, shrubs aren't causing a problem for someone else. If you live next to a sidewalk or on a corner lot, we need your help to keep these areas safe. Now that means trimming back your plants if they're crawling onto the sidewalk or making sure your trees and shrubs aren't blocking the view of drivers at the corner. We, we do the sight line abatement issues, just it's purely for public safety. It's to make our roadway safe so people can walk, people can drive, people can bike. And that's why it's based on uh, eyesight distance based on the speed limit. In the, in the last couple of years we've had uh, two accidents where the sight line issue was a big issue for us. And often the homeowner is more than willing to go out and trim up the shrub. They just they didn't know it had grown that much. It never occurred to me at all. I trim my bushes back every year. Well, I've lived here for two years, so um, 
but I have trimmed them back every year and never with safety in mind, only aesthetics. And uh, this was a big wake up call for me. I immediately wanted to take care of it. And I think most people would if they were aware of it. Today, talking with Kent, he was very thorough in explaining what the exact specifications are. As a property owner, they have the responsibility to take care of the sidewalk and the alleyways in front of their homes. Um, a lot of people don't even know this. I come when I get a complaint about some vegetation or a concern. I'll send out an abatement letter and what and in that letter will say that some vegetation needs to be cut back so people have the full use of the of the sidewalk or the alley or the street. In the letter I'm at, I give the people 30 days to do this. If they call me and say there's a problem, you know, a broken arm, I can't do this right now, you know, I'll work with you on the time frame. We send out about five, six hundred letters a year. I'm not just out looking for these areas. And it's mainly complaint driven. If I get a complaint, someone's already complained about it, I'll come out and look at an area. I need the full width of the sidewalk from edge to edge cleared back to a height of eight feet. If it's over the street, I need from the curb line up a clearance of 15 feet. So trucks, sweepers, other machinery coming down the road don't hit those things. Then in the alleys also, from the improved part of the alleys, what's gravel from the edge of the gravel part of the alleys to a clearance of 15 feet over the alleyways also. The planting strip between the curb and the sidewalk is in the right of way, but it's up to the property owner to take care of all vegetation within that area. The city cares about this because the people need to be able to walk in a safe manner down the sidewalks that are provided to them through the city. And with this stuff growing out, it's not safe for anybody. If you have a problem, you see something over the sidewalk, please call. I'll be glad to come out and take a look and see if it needs to be cut back. As a homeowner, if I send you one of these letters and you have questions about it, please call. I'll be glad to meet you, show you, talk to you. What we're after is, you know, everyone's safety. These guidelines help keep pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers safe. We'd love to get your ideas for stories and segments on Inside Bellingham. So if you have springtime feedback or ideas, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us through our website or directly via email. Well, it's time to put away those winter clothes and see if those shorts still fit from uh, last summer. Now, don't worry if they don't. There's still time to start a weight loss program. Now, uh, a whole lot of time, so uh, what you might do is start by walking around our incredible city, on our fabulous trails, uh, in our wonderful parks. Get outside. The, uh, the snow is uh, <coughs> finally gone. I'm Doug Waldo. Thanks for watching.